So uh, I'd just like to welcome you on uh, behalf of Wycliffe College and the Meeting House uh, to our monthly theology pub. Uh, we didn't have one last uh, week because of a film shoot in this room, but uh, we're having two this month, so uh, it's exciting. Uh, and we're just really privileged and honored to have uh, Dr. David Reed with us tonight. He's an emeritus professor from this college and uh, expert on all things strange. And uh, so I'm going to let uh, Dr. Reed uh, share a little bit about uh, how he got into these kinds of topics and a little bit about his background. And we're going to then watch a few video clips and talk about the paranormal. And uh, there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask some questions and have some conversations as well. And I just hope you enjoy the evening. So I'll just turn it over to Dr. Reed. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, this topic of the paranormal and charismatic and, and, yeah. and, and such. Well, I'm glad you all came. My wife was clear that she would not come and join us. I cannot even tell a joke about a ghost. That's way too much for her. Um, it, there's two levels of this. One, I was brought up Pentecostal. And immediately, if there's a difference between a, a Pentecostal and a cessationist fundamentalist, you understand that. And so in the Pentecostal world, we talked about things, experienced things that, that some other evangelical Christians didn't. And, uh, but those are mostly centered around, around healing, uh, and modalities, stories of, uh, of, of healing. That was most common. Um, and I knew a missionary, I knew the family and I knew him personally, this goes back to the 50s, that had cancer for over two, two years, third stage, as they called it anyway, in the late 50s. And he had 18 inches of his bowel eaten away by cancer. And he had gone from 180 pounds to 120, was weak, and he was not given a good chance, except maybe surgery or something. And uh, that man, without going to the whole story, because I knew him, I knew what happened. Within 24 hours, that all turned around. He had been in the hospital, checked himself out. He was a stubborn guy, and, uh, and went to a clergy conference. He was prayed for there, although there had been prayer teams for this man for almost two years. 24 hours around the clock in many places. He was very popular. And within, when he went back to the hospital, he knew something had changed. In his, uh, in his system within hours. He went back to the hospital, they did x-rays, he had 18 inches of uh, scar tissue, that was all. And he was out of the hospital, he ended up going, he'd been in Colombia, South America as a missionary for years, he ended up going to Spain. So when I have a story like that, I, if you're, you know, I'm not, tell my wife, I'm not courageous, but I am curious. And I try to think about these things sometimes, how did this happen? And so stories like that kind of build into your system. Uh, and there'll be other things at the personal level, but uh, when I went into pastoral ministry in the United States, um, and then in the late 60s was ordained, pastored for 18 years. One morning, a, a woman in the church, normal woman, married with two kids, uh, not strange, not, uh, not no flowers coming out of her ears or anything like that. She was... Uh, a very uh, kind of straight, normal, middle-class woman, family, came to me and said, I want to talk to you. So I said, uh, what is it? So we sat down, made an appointment, and then she started telling me about what had happened in, the, in, her, uh, at, in her home. She said, the other morning, she said, we, my husband and I were awakened with a thrashing downstairs in the house, and we were afraid, it was around 6 o'clock, and we were afraid that Somebody was breaking in. So they got out of bed, rushed downstairs. She went to the back door. He went to the front door. He grabbed the, uh, the, uh, the iron from the, uh, from the uh, fireplace. And uh, she went to the back, could find, see absolutely nothing. The dew was still on the grass, no marks, no footprints, nothing. And so, excuse me, I'm neglecting people over here. Uh, and so she, uh, she said that, in fact, that was the start of it. And, uh, and I said, look, I don't know what's going on here either, but I said, I will walk with you through this as, 
if anything else comes up, we can have a conversation about it. So we did for quite a while. And just to, to move that along, I, so I learned, you know, stuff that was happening, you know, things were, a little bit of poltergeist stuff would happen in the house and uh, strange things. Eventually her husband died and she moved, as we moved to Canada, she was moving to Massachusetts. So one day I said to her, I said, uh, I contacted her uh, because we kept in touch and I, I, I said, could I talk to you about this? So I went and interviewed her a few years ago. And whatever was going on down in Connecticut, they moved to Massachusetts with her, believe it or not. So she was having the same kind of issues. Little things around the house, a clock, and something else moves around a little bit. So I won't go into all the details, but she said, no, whatever's going on here, so these are not bad. Sometimes they're a little mischievous. But she said, I call them my angels now. Because when I am, like if I, she, one time she lost her keys, couldn't, didn't know where they were. And she said, okay, guys, she says, get to work. She said, I don't know where my keys are. And so things like that actually helped her. She intuitively kind of figured out where things were. So uh, those, that was my, my largest pastoral situation where I had to start thinking about this because it was outside my range of, of understanding uh, what, what to say or what, what was going on. So she's telling me how these things were working functioning and so I have to I take that at her at her at, at her word she's a normal person she's and I've had lots of corroboration since then to say that's what's going on so that is all, all happened when I came here is the third piece if I can shorten this up is that um, uh, you know you, you they have a media center here uh, at the university so any professor in the system can fill out a form and say, here's what I'm interested in, or if I'm writing a book on such and such a topic, or researching something, or areas that I'm willing to talk about, that I have some interest in, you fill it out. Well, I wrote stuff that no respecting professor would ever, would ever uh, write down. I was, it, it was, I was doing uh, marriage and family stuff, so I was talking marriage, family, singles, sex, and a whole bunch of things that got me into all sorts of situations. and, uh, and uh, but also sex, S-E-C-T-S, and cults, because I had some experience with some of that as well. And so somehow in the process, I had said something about, uh, written something, something about the demonic and deliverance and exorcisms. And, uh, and uh, a production company got a hold of that and contacted me and asked if I would be one of the consultants on this TV series called Ghostly Encounters. It's not a dramatization. These are just documentaries, one or two people sitting in a chair and actually being interviewed. And then they put that together for, for the program. It was so successful uh, after the first year that it kept every year. They just kept wanting more and more. So it went for, I think, five years, something like that. And uh, I, that, I, didn't do, I was a consultant, which means I would review and go through them. I didn't claim to be an expert, you understand, but they still felt I knew something enough to, to go with it. So I did, and I think I was learning more than anybody else. But uh, I had to look at all these cases, but I was always asking myself, what's going on here? So I saw a range uh, of, of phenomena, if you like. And uh, uh, David's also an uh, extensive world traveler, and so he has lots of stories from different cultures, uh, strange happenings and occurrences. Uh, from all around the world, but we'll probably Actually, get into a little bit of that some, tonight. Some in, some in Africa, yeah. uh, especially. So, uh, yeah, I'd just like to welcome you tonight. Um, also, we just recognize that like some of the stuff might be tough, and so I'll try and give some fair warnings. If we're going to watch a clip or something that might be scary or intense, uh, try to give some forewarning on that as well. And also, just feel like this is a, a safe space. Like It might be topics that are uncomfortable or new, uh, but we just want to kind of create an atmosphere that we're just curious, wanting to look into uh, some of these topics. And we won't mention that our tech guy got a 15-minute nosebleed after putting together <laughs> these clips. <laughs> mm. Ghosts. Do you remember that case? As it went on, I did. Okay. Yeah, as it went on, I did. Uh, a number of things come up in a story like this. One is the, one is the physicality uh, that 
that it's not we call it poltergeists or thing objects moving around the ability to move them. This is one of the things that that really struck me in terms of how do you explain that? So much of what people think they know about or because they've heard about uh, the paranormal, um, they they usually boil it down to say, well, it's something that somebody's thinking in their head, you know, that your imagination, all of those sorts of things, or somebody might be mentally ill and perceive certain things. But when you actually have uh, a knife coming down, you have physical objects moving around, you're, you're, you have to then to enlarge your thinking and say, okay, whatever's going on here, it is outside my imagination. Something physically has happened. So the physicality has... Um, uh, the ability to use physical objects to move them around <clears throat> is, is a part of it. So I had to take that into account. The, uh, the, uh, the second thing we might want to talk about later uh, would be uh, uh, whether or not, I think she used the word evil or something like that, didn't she? Um, uh, the evangelic, let me start by saying the a lot of the Christian world, I should say, in the modern era has got rid of, they've emptied this, the invisible universe. So the only universe we just we generally know and think about is the physical, empirical world that we can see. So anything that happens from the outside, it, we've, it's blank. We have no way to answer or to explain that. It, it has to be something in our head. And, uh, and, and so... Uh, I, I've come to realize that a lot of Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, uh, because Catholics have saints and all sorts of things that, 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 they, that, they, that they are aware of, uh, but Protestant Christianity doesn't have a very full theology of creation, the full creation, you know, the visible and the, and the visible world. And so if you don't have that, then you have very little way to understand these kinds of things, especially the voices, the physicality uh, that, that's involved. But also, when it comes to who inhabits the invisible universe, well, God is outside the universe, right? Uh, unless you're a pantheist. Uh, so what, what's there? Angels. Now, it depends. A lot of liberal Christians, we might call them, don't believe in any of that stuff. So, but if you are kind of a traditional Christian or evangelical or a Catholic or uh, Orthodox, you would, you would believe in at least in angels. That's God's, God's agents for communicating in many ways to the world. Secondly, uh, you might, you don't even know what, to, what they're like, but you might talk about the demonic, the demons, and demons or evil spirits. And, and then the, the senior devil, as C.S. Lewis would say, is, is, uh, is Satan. But we have no place. See what's missing is, is maybe departed spirits uh, or other. And one person I know believes that, that the, the invisible universe is inhabited by all sorts of spirits uh, uh, that are neither, neither evil, bad, like the demons, or angelic. And in Africa, frankly, a lot of these spirits are neither good nor bad. They just do what you tell them to do. So if you've got a relationship with a, uh, a spirit, you, you go to that, that spirit and say, I want you to put a hex or something on, on my neighbor because they did so and so and uh, such and such, and, and they will just go ahead and do it. I so as like, far as... It highlights a little bit about how worldview can affect how we interpret what lens we use to interpret these types right. of pheno phenomena. Yeah. I think in the story it talked a little bit about Eastern versus Western, and we also have like religious frames and non-religious frames, right. and how to like kind of, um, I guess, um, determine how we process these types of uh, events. Yeah, and one other piece on that would be the ancestors, yeah. uh, that, that they, they are so honored in Asia and in, in Africa, for instance. And, and over here, we, uh, we just have tombstones. You know, we, don't, we don't honor them in the same way once they die. So what do you say to like a modern person who says, you know, oh, ghosts are just 
fairy tales. They're just um, they're just in your head, or even uh, maybe a, a somebody that's from a traditional Christian background that would say, "There's no such thing as a ghost. It's just a demon causing yeah. mischief." Uh, you know, how is that true, or how do you kind of process through those kinds of things? Well, in, in my case, I would simply ha have to say that the stories that I that I find credible uh, don't fit into necessarily an angelic or demonic. I feel that the demonic is particularly designed to, uh, uh, or uh, the purpose for the demonic is to thwart the will and purpose of God. And it, in whatever that might mean, uh, that is their job. And you have so many stories here when you look at a range of stories that they, they don't fit that category. And they may be good, but they also may be just simply mischievous. Or they may just want to let you know that they're present. Or they might not like you in their, in, in their boat. They, they've been there before in that house before you were. So they, they don't like it. So I, I would say you, you, you should at least explore the stories that have credibility and, and, uh, and begin to think about how you would explain that in ways other than what I'm suggesting that there are other uh, spiritual beings. So what would you say to the skeptic that would say, well, every time we try and empirically test it or go into these places, there is no evidence of, of this stuff, and it seems as though it's just in the minds of the people or it's some kind of group psychology that's creating these, these situations. Uh, well, they have not looked at enough evidence, that's all I can tell you. Uh, because once you do, then you have to, if it's credible at all, you have to take it into account. And, and you don't get everything that you want just by running around with a microphone or a camera. Because you're forcing something to happen, or you're hoping it will happen when you were there. And one small case of that, I only know one case, but I know it personally. And, and I know the person who still keeps questioning about it. But you, you know, uh, uh, xenolalia, or xenoglossy, which means the ability to speak another language that you have never known. Have you ever heard of that? Understand? Sometimes they, when people who speak in tongues, uh, they have used to think at the beginning that they were speaking foreign languages so they could run off to China and speak in, in Chinese and evangelize Chinese. It didn't work. Uh, but I have a close friend from my teenage years who was a minister and was brought up Pentecostal as I was. And when he was in his early teens, had the experience of finally speaking in tongues as what Pentecostals call the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. A missionary woman came, was there in, with that family because his father was director of foreign missions for that denomination as well as being the pastor of the church. And that's that night that that happened, uh, there was a missionary woman from Africa. I mean, she, she was a Western missionary who uh, was ministering in Africa. And she uh, and, and my friend's mother came over to hear him finally speaking in tongues, the missionary said, he is speaking in an African dialogue, dialect of a tribe that I work with in Africa. I recognize it. Two things, one is he is not, he has no accent. It's very difficult uh, language and he's speaking it fluently as a native in that tribe would speak. And secondly, I recognize that he is giving an exhortation on love. Now, he didn't know what to do with it. He still doesn't know what to do with it, but it happened. And so, you know, you don't usually have people around uh, with cameras and uh, everything ready to, when it doesn't happen when you're there, you see. Uh, so I just, I just use that uh, one illustration to indicate how this so I'd, I'd like to take a poll um, in this room if you feel comfortable. How many of you or how many of you know someone or yourself have experienced some kind of a ghostly or paranormal uh, phenomenon? I don't know if you're comfortable just to raise your hand. Um, 
It was surprising as we were kind of prepping okay. for this. Okay. Yeah. As we were kind of prepping for this day, and I was kind of chatting with people, almost everybody I talked to, either themselves or their mom or their aunt, or they would share stories of uh, some kind of phenomenon that happened. And uh, I remember one of, a friend of mine who has two PhDs, um, he told me a story of uh, a guy that he really disliked uh, in, in university, uh, passed away suddenly as a young person. And he's, he told me, like, he appeared in my room, you know. And he's like, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, this, this happened, you know. And so uh, this, like, scientist, you know, like, the most empirical person, he's like, I can't explain, you know, this. And, uh, yeah, so I'm interested in the hands that went up. I mean, that probably beats Billy Graham. We're going we're gonna to get to Q&A after. And I, no, I, no, no, I just oh. want to observe the same thing that you just pointed oh, okay. out, that if I didn't believe uh, the stories that I was watching in preparation for the ghostly encounters, I would have been, by telling people, I had students and others come to say, what are you working on these days? And I said, let me tell you, before the conversation was over, at least seven out of 10 people would say, let me tell you my story. They wouldn't use those words necessarily. It was either about them or somebody else. One of um, my former students who is now a bishop, uh, we started to talk one day, and, uh, as, and as I told her what I was doing, she asked, and, uh, and then she, she told me a story. I said, you know, I, I, it's something that happened as well. We ended up talking for an hour, and in that hour, she remembered five different things that had happened in her life, that, that just one, one situation. So uh, a number of things have happened. So uh, we're going to come back to some of these themes. I want to turn a little bit uh, to demons and demonology and exorcism. And I have a clip, which is from the exorcism of Emily Rose. Demons. Uh, yeah. To begin, because I don't want to miss it, that there's somebody here who knows a lot more about that than I do, is Janet Warren Wright behind here. Put your hand up so everybody can see you. But she has a book uh, that deals with this, uh, Cleansing the Cosmos. And uh, so I want to just advertise that book for her. And I think she might have copies around if you want to talk to her. But she's, uh, she really works in this area. And we've talked a little bit about Scott Peck, remember, who wrote that book, uh, The Road Less Traveled. And then his next book was The People of the Lie. He lived in Connecticut, where I passed her not very far away. And his uh, and I got to know a little bit about his, about his work and his exploration into that. And then, uh, uh, then his, I think the title of his last book, a small book, uh, before he died, he, he, he then told, People the Lie was about his exploring uh, the, the demonic, and then this was his 20 years, the last book was his 20 years of, uh, of uh, incorporating that in his own uh, psychotherapeutic practice. The demonic. So you had one interesting story I, I, that you talked to me about a, a number of years back about a baptism in Asia, and they had a pool. Oh, yes. yes yeah. Yes. Why don't you share a little bit about that? Uh, it was kind of like a one-off, but um, it was a charismatic church, but he believed that he had the, uh, that, that he had had a particular way into really literal water cleansing. He believed almost like water being sacramental in this sense. Uh, but the case you're referring to happened just uh, two or three weeks before I was there. I saw and I videotaped the water ritual and there was some few phenomena or manifestations. But this other one was most unusual. Uh, he has a team. He has people in the in the pool that want to be prayed for and cleansed and, and cleaned and all of that. But he, for each person almost, he would have a, a team member. And while they were preparing or being involved in, in this, the, the video shows the team, a team member becoming uh, either possessed or, or influenced by, uh, by, by a spirit. And the spirit, it turns out, as far as they were concerned, was a, uh, was a spirit uh, that was attached to a small, almost like a little 
I don't know, attached to the side of the pool uh, that was supposed to be the Queen of the South Seas. And uh, it, it was like a little bird's nest almost, but it was attached to the side. And that's where it, it housed itself. But it did not like the fact that this team of Christians were coming in to actually conduct a Christian uh, uh, practice of baptism, not baptism, but a ritual. And so it began to, to inhabit this young woman who was the, uh, the, uh, one of the ministering team members and began to scream, at, get out of my pool, get out of my pool, and splashing water like he was in a tantrum. Said you're messing up my pool and, and so on, and it went on like that until they, the pastor and the t other team members tried to calm her down, and uh, so then he starts. It was interesting how the pastor started to talk with her, and so he no longer was talking to her; he was talking to the spirit, and uh, and began to negotiate. And going back to the uh, parable of the, uh, remember the the, the the pigs that that uh, that went into the. Uh, uh, went over over the cliff. Remember how Jesus negotiated with with uh, with them. You know, leave us alone, and 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 then he said, he said, if you leave, so long he would, uh, uh, so long as you leave the, uh, this person. Well, that's kind of what he did. He said, we're only here for two hours, and so uh, uh, that wasn't enough for her, for it, and uh, kept saying, no, get out of the pool. And finally, he did, I watched, and he was. It started at very gently to to him to negotiate, and it would negotiate. So it finally uh, ramped up to finally he started to threaten me. If you do not leave uh, this person, uh, I am going to have my one of my team members trash your home over there on, on the wall. And then it just went into a big tantrum. No, 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 no! You can't do this! And, and splashed around, and made a great big fuss. And uh, it was only after he, f he, he really forced and was going to actually do the deed that it finally released. Now, interesting enough, in the midst of that, they show another clip where, where she, uh, uh, she, her eyes were, were shut and she could not open them. It was like she was paralyzed in her eyelids and he would try to open them for her and, uh, and it, it was very difficult to do. But she does get momentarily delivered, and then he, they interview her afterward, uh, or at some point, and she explains what that was like, and about the, and she, I can't see anything, everything was black, and she describes it that way. They go back into the pool, and it happens again to her. And then you can see him go through a, a much more complete uh, uh, deliverance or exorcism of the spirit from her till so finally she just she just relaxed and and he just held her in his arm uh, when she while she floated in the pool, but uh, it was clearly some kind of uh, taking over some at least some of her motor responsibility. And this is a question of I've I've asked when it comes to the demonic, uh, how much does an evil spirit or even Another spirit that has, you know, a departed spirit that has some level of control, poltergeist, and so on, where you can talk with them sometimes, and uh, and sometimes it's uh, they, they they will they'll respond to you. Uh, one woman north of Toronto, they they uh, they bought a house, and the uh, the uh, there was somewhere in somebody in that house, and she finally sensed the presence but already pulled the, the uh, ceiling light out in the family room, scared the kids to death, and uh, spooked her husband when he didn't believe it at first. And, uh, and finally, she got to the point where she could sense its presence. And said, I, I was in my bedroom, and so I heard, felt this spirit or whatever it was coming down the hallway, and it came to the door and stopped, and I knew it was there. And so she finally said, I don't know who you are, and I have no idea what, you, what you're doing here but you're messing up my whole family. She said, you're freaking the kids out. My husband's upset. She said, I'm scared. And she said, we bought this house and I like it and I'm paying a mortgage on it. She said, so either you leave us alone or get out. And it did, never come back. 
And so the lesson that I learned from this and the other stories is that when it comes to, at least to the ancestors <laughs> or the, the spirits, that you can talk to them. You don't have to be as afraid. I'm not sure how I would be, but uh, I've, I've encountered one. But you, you literally, uh, it's essentially not being afraid of them. You talk back and uh, tell them what, what you want, and sometimes they, they respond. But in this, in this case, the question in my mind is, if it's an evil spirit, like you, you said, Janet, that was kind of overdone. I believe they can control your, your parts of your body, maybe like the eyelids uh, uh, can. I think you can, they can make different uh, sounds. They can create smells. They can change the temperature in the room. These are all things that's, that, that happen. Uh, move stuff around. Uh, they can probably affect your mood and make you feel really upset or uh, dark, anything like that. I, I would like to know whether it can literally control your mind. Some believe that, that, that a, a de demonic spirit can, can take executive control of your mind so that they are, they are operating the machine, they're driving the car, and they're not. But I noticed Scott Peck, uh, I was challenged with this when he would always, uh, the, the people that he was being mentored under, the Warrens, I believe is their name, uh, they would stop half part way through an exorcism and say, how are you doing? Okay. What's it feel like now? Okay. Uh, are you ready to go on? Okay. So there's a level of free will that they had. So uh, that's still a question in my mind, but I, somehow I, I'm more with Scott Peck. I think that they can mess with your mind. I'm not sure that they can take executive control, but that's an opinion I have at this point. So I want to give some time to the audience to ask some questions and raise some comments, and then we'll have some time to chat afterwards um, uh, at length. And so, uh, Terry, do you have a microphone kicking around? Does anybody have a question for Dr. Reed, uh, a comment or a story? Hi, how are you going? Uh, thanks for coming. It's great to see you. Um, I guess I got the question that would say, you say they're very common, like 7 and 10 um, was, was kind of your, your number. Uh, and that's, you know, anecdotal stuff too. But now that we live in kind of, the common argument is now that we live in the age of the iPhone where everyone does have, you know, a camera. And people have smart houses and cameras all in their houses. You would think there would just be a plethora of, of documented camera footage. Now, it, I, I don't do a lot of research on this. Is there like a ton of documented footage of this, or is it maybe not as common as, as the kind of seven and 10 figure, or, or if there is, I'd love to see where some documented footage is. I, I, my first response is that usually when something like this happens, you don't have your camera ready. Uh, Usually, you say, let me just stand there for a moment. I don't want to turn this on. Uh, uh, and that some of them are dreams, that some of them happen in different, uh, different circumstances. Uh, yeah, it, it is. And the thing is, uh, as we were talking earlier, what credibility do you give to, uh, to anecdotes or to people's stories? I, I spent uh, three or four days uh, two years ago in Auckland, New Zealand, the University of Auckland, uh, it was a symposium on the paranormal, and uh, they just lacked a theologian. They had a philosopher, but everybody else was either the psychiatrist, anthropologist, sociologist, and so they worked on various groups, you know, voodoo and, and all of that. And all they could deal with was the, uh, the phenomenon. But the point I'm trying to make is that they all deal, did field-based research, and so they had to interview sometimes they could observe. Um, I think it's also, could I add that it's also difficult sometimes to, to interpret behavior. Uh, I have been in a number of churches in, in America, in African American churches in particular, uh, where I saw a uh, phenomenon, uh, physical uh, manifestations. Uh, but in Ghana, I was in a church that, where the pastor specializes in 
exorcisms and deliverance and healing. And uh, I saw similar phenomena, but they were interpreting those phenomena as kind of as negative spiritual stuff that needed to be delivered. What I saw in North America was it was actually a, a blessing, the, the spirit of the Holy Spirit possessing them, if you like. So it's a, that's a question in my mind. So I think there's issues of interpreting. And I think there's like, it might be a little bit of a cop out, but I've heard some people say that, you know, like things like consumerism and, you know, affluence and all these things that maybe are uh, ways that uh, we are controlled nowadays. So there, there, not, there needs not be the same manifestations in the past. But that's kind of like, it's maybe a cop out. And I totally recognize that. But uh, I think. It's worth no, I think least. Scott Peck yeah. actually makes, I think he's the one that makes that point, yeah. that the demonic appears in lots of different ways. And, and I can't find the, the quotation. I don't know if you remember, Janet, but I tried to look back. I think he's the one that said the, the, the demonic is the request to shed innocent blood. I find that pretty profound. Well, there, there are books out there uh, on, on mostly on stories, but in, if you're talking about kind of empirical evidence of uh, 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 of this, you're you're usually not around when it happens. It doesn't necessarily happen to happen at night, but I can think of a haunted house. I won't tell you the whole story. In Coburg, talk, uh, the interview the the couple, and uh, uh, this is the one case where there where a, a spirit can create physical space that, that is invisible. He lies down to have a, a rest in the afternoon. She g comes in to crawls up along behind him to spoon, you know, get from behind. And she can't get, she can only get about a foot to him. She can't get any closer. And she said, but this is weird, so what's going on? He said, that's Molly, she says she's here. Molly was a ghost in the house they've been talking about, but it's the first time I've ever heard that part of that kind of story. Uh, but, but the anecdotes are, there's a lot of them, and a, and a quite a variety. Yeah, that actually sets me up really well, because uh, my question was going to be on the, on the, so, on the veracity of anecdotes <laughs> as a form of evidence. Um, just following up to the guy uh, who was speaking before, since we have very few um, sort of really, really high quality uh, video evidence of the paranormal, uh, what would your response be to considering that most of the evidence that most paranormal researchers have collected is anecdotal, what would your response be to the more recent scientific discoveries of the human memory being extremely mutable and that uh, memory is very, very easy to change and implant false memory? So what would your response to that be? Just like any other sort of empirical evidence, you need to sort through uh, the, the stories I would say try to discern if there are any, and I'm not sure I can give you the criteria at this point, but uh, discern where there may be elaborations or maybe false memories. Uh, but again, I, I, I tend to work on, I guess, on volume to some degree. Uh, when people that have no reason to, to have false memories, uh, again, all, let me say that's internal as well. Uh, that have false memories of that, uh, that can differentiate, for instance, from like this bishop that I referred to. Her first story was, she said, one night during the night, she said, I had a dream, it was very quick, and she said, in that dream, my grandmother appeared to me and said, it's okay. And the next morning, she got a phone call that her grandmother had died during the night. Now, that's a different kind of story. She, she knew that she had had that dream. And uh, th let me tell you another one that happened to me. 1981, I was teaching in the Sudan. Was that, I was teaching on the Holy Spirit. It was in the, uh, uh, at the Theological College, the Anglican School. And uh, they asked for, because of the topic uh, of healing came up, they asked if we could have a healing service on Wednesday. So I'll make this really short. They had the healing service. The young man came and, and uh, uh, and um, I'll tell you, yeah, came and said, I, I want you to pray for my mother-in-law back in the village. And they didn't know that we were there at all. And she said she's depressed. She's, 
She gets up in the morning, walks around, goes back to bed, doesn't clean up her tuko, they call it, a hut, and she doesn't cook any meals, and she's been this way for quite a while, and we we're worried about it. And she says, would you pray for her? So I did. Okay, five years later, I'm back in Connecticut, near New York City. The archbishop comes, and, I've, uh, and I got a call, asked if I'd like to have lunch with him. He came, but he had a young priest on his, on his arm helping him. He had a bad hip and, and a big smile on this young man's face. And he came up to me, grabbed my hand, and he says, I'm Allison, you don't remember me, maybe. But he said, I, I was at Bishop Wynn College when you, were, when you were there. And I want to tell you something I don't think you know about, so here's what happened. That night, uh, that Wednesday evening, that night, his wife, back in the village, where her mother was, she had a dream, and in her dream, she saw a white man standing over her mother in the bed. And a voice came to her and said, Salome, Salome, do not be afraid. Your mother is going to be well. The next morning, a doctor comes into the village, makes his rounds, goes to the house, finds, realizes she's depressed, gives her some antidepressant medication. She gets up within a few hours. Five years later, I said, how is she? He said, she hasn't had a relapse. She's been fine. That is not just false memory stuff. Well, there's a difference between false memories and um, the, Im the mutability of the human memory. You know, you said that, we, okay. that memory was from 1981. That, mem that event was from 1981, you said? Yes. Yeah, so um, there's a difference between false memories and just people rec recollecting things incorrectly. So I, I do, you know, so yeah, yeah, that would be my, my question is what element of uh, supernatural and paranormal thought do you think could be contributed to false recollection? Well, I'd have to, uh, I'm still not sure that you are, I'd like to just, this is the string hand. So it was five years later, why would I think that that was false memory on, or change of memory on his, you know, his part? Well, because it's very easy to change the human memory, and that has been scientifically proven. Well, I suppose it's very easy, but that, I have to say, I, I, I believe that. He, he'd have no reason. It wasn't, I don't think this was his, his, he was giving an account of his wife and his mother-in-law and what happened. So you, so you don't believe that it's, um, that it's possible to sort of change the human memory in that way? Well, uh, I think, which he said, all things are possible. Um, no, I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in your but, response to that. No, uh, I'm not sure how I can... I think, I think you, would, you would say that like all of us want to create you know, um, coherence in our thoughts, right? And part of it, like if you're a religious person, like you're going to sort things in a re religious way, just as a skeptic would sort things in a skeptical way. And I, I, think, uh, I think we need to be aware of our biases for sure whenever we look at that, and um, I think that's part of the conversation and the dialectic when we do talk about these types of phenomenon, and I think, yeah, there is a lot of complexity to how we know something to be true and how we discern those things and how we interpret those facts, and I think you raise a valid um, yeah, point. And, um, and, and, I, and I would agree, I mean, I, I know of stories that have been told that have been elaborated over the years. Yeah, I, I understand. If, I think that's what you're talking about. This was so crisp that I, I have a difficulty in thinking that he had elaborated. It was very, it was, it was very brief, very clear, and, and there was an outcome as well, namely his mother-in-law's health. Uh, and his wife just had a dream, so, uh, I mean, he gave me a, a line, I'm quoting the best I can remember the, the words he, that he said that, that she heard during the night. But I, uh, in terms of telling stories, oh gosh, I've heard never enough evangelistic stories to know that, that uh, stories bend. I'm really just interested in how angels can help me find my keys, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was actually interested by that story, and I'm wondering if you could maybe just talk a little bit about your experience, uh, the difference between, we talk a lot about evil spirits, but then you're saying there are also good spirits, angelic spirits that seem to linger around, as it were, um, and part of this, maybe you can help define the word haunting, you know, like this idea that something is lingering, hanging around, doing something, and is, what has your experience been between demonic and, say, a good spirit or an angelic spirit? Look, I'm just two things. One, that. I guess, is with the haunting. All, all, uh, 
all, all I have is kind of uh, from quantum physics, the, this whole notion of energy that is, uh, that, uh, that can materialize or there are intuitions that people have and so on, a sense of, of, of somebody's presence uh, or something's presence. So there are, there, there is, in the hauntings, there's uh, that ether that they, they talk about that is, that, that has, has presence to it. Um, uh, the, uh, but the other question I think you're pointing to is, it probably would take a little bit of work to discern whether something is truly demonic and whether or not it is, let's say, a, uh, a, a departed spirit. What I think I concluded was in all these stories that, were, in my mind, I wouldn't call them demonic uh, at all, but this is a simplistic way of saying, you know, if you're, if you're a jackass, I have other words, but I'm going to take a polite one, you're jackass in this life. Just because you die doesn't mean you're going to change your personality. You're still going to be a jackass. I don't think anything miraculous happens to you for a person's personality necessarily. If, in fact, there is some sense of consciousness that, that survives the, the physical death. And so there's a number of stories. One came out of Hamilton. A woman rents an apartment, and she... Uh, she feels, discovers poltergeist, things happening around, around her apartment. She begins to detect there's a presence there that doesn't want her there, trying to scare her. There's a lot of stories where they try to scare you out of the place because they don't want you around. So one day she's sitting at the kitchen table with a bowl of ice cream. She picks up the spoon and puts a spoon of ice cream in her mouth. A cold hand grabs her by the wrist, shoves the spoon so hard into her mouth that her gums bleed as a result of that. Now that is not just in my, her mind. Uh, it was that kind of physical reaction. Can I tell my favorite story? It was one of these ghostly encounter stories. It happened here in Toronto. Young man is being interviewed, and here's the story. He, he was working at one of his colleagues in, a, in an office or someplace where they were together. He was a man, she's a young woman, she's both single. And they both were going to move and looking for another place to, to rent, or renting a room in the house. And uh, so they decided, well, why don't we find a, a two rooms and we'll, so that we'll be in the same house, we'll come to work together and so on. They were just friends. So she's in a third, third floor apartment and he has a room on the second floor. So <laughs> one day, he's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's on a Saturday. And so he's, then neither one of them were working. And he's in his uh, in his room, and uh, and she uh, she has a new boyfriend, and so he comes up to her apartment on Saturday afternoon, and uh, they have a little bit of afternoon delight, and uh, okay, I'll skip to what happens. The guy on the second floor, this he's the one that's telling the story, and all of a sudden he hears this thrashing and crashing and stomping around, and he said, what is going on up there? His door is open, and, uh, and, and, and he sees that he hears somebody running down the steps, this guy, and he runs up down the hall, past the room, he's still putting on his clothes while he's running down the second floor to get, to, to get out of the house. So he comes up and asks his friend, he said, what happened here? And she's laughing. Oh, she said, there's a, there's a ghost here, and she said, I said, I know, so I'm not afraid of being around. What happened? After the afternoon delight, she goes over to the computer or something, we're doing something. He's lying back like this, just, uh, you know, just relaxing. All of a sudden, without any warming, a cold hand grabs him right by the ankle. And he freaks. You can imagine him freak. And he races, puts his clothes on the ground, and that's what, what happened. That's part A. Part B is a few weeks later. It's in January, it's in wintertime. She takes the weekend off to go skiing. On Saturday afternoon, sat Saturday sometime, the guy is in his room and in the second floor and things start moving around. Things start happening in his, in his room and he's, oh no, he said, he said, this thing upstairs is finally down here looking for her probably. So he gets very upset, finally settles down. Sunday night she's back and he says to her, 
your friend who's visiting me. I don't like it. He said, I'm getting out of here. And she said, oh no, she said, I think he, I think it's, he, He's maybe being protect. It's maybe being protective of me because, because uh, it's a new boyfriend and maybe it knows more about my boyfriend than I do. And he's just trying to be nice to me, uh, but to me. And and he said, "Well, I don't know." He said, "You can stay here with Casper, your friend, if you want to." He said, "I'm leaving." Anyway, in the end, she does go with him, and if I, then I'm asked to respond in some way. So what I've done at the end is basically say, you know, she. She thought that this spirit, this ghost or whatever, was being protective of her, and she thought it was kind of cute and kind of nice, you know, looking after me and so on. And I said, the fact that it came down on the second floor looking for her, I said, I think whatever it is, it's more possessive than it is protective. And I said, she made the right decision to leave. So that's how I ended my piece of the story uh, on that because I thought she would be, because she wasn't afraid of it, she was kind of naive. And, and I, so there's where the, there was a jealousy coming in. It was not just get out of the space, but it was getting attached to the young woman. So if it's a dis, departed spirit, then those, those things kind of happen. So I just try to fill out the stories. I understand it. Okay, we're gonna do a last question and then we'll, you can ask as many questions afterwards as you want. So go ahead. Sure. Like, I will just follow the storyline. Like, I will share my story, one of my stories as well. That um, I, I came from Hong Kong. So my grandma lives, lived in Hong Kong. So one night, many years ago, I was sleeping. And then in the middle of the night, I was w waken up by a door knock. Like, two really loud door knocks on my door and I was waking up and I, when I looked at the door and you know under the door you can see if someone is standing there so someone was standing there so I thought like oh that's just my mom like maybe they, she wants something from me so and then if she wants it enough she will open the door and come for me but she didn't open the door so I fell back asleep and then in the morning my dad came into my room and then he pat me on my face and said, I have something to tell you. Grandma passed away last night. And my grandma was very close to me. So like just, and I asked everyone, like I, I just pretend nothing happened. And I was like, mom, did you come to my door and knock to my door last night? I said, no. And my dad didn't and that's the whole household. There's no, not anyone in the house that would come. <laughs> so, like, to me, that, it, it feels like it was my grandma, say, just coming to say goodbye to me. So my question is, like, do you, do you believe in human spirit? And what does the Bible say about it? Do I believe in what? In human spirit. Human spirit. Like, because, like you said, there are demonic uh, presence and the angelic one and then like something in between like so do you believe in that and what does the Bible say about it? The Bible says very little uh, you've got the witch of Endor uh, and that's everybody refers to that because that's, that's about the only one we have we have a count of where where uh, I forget her name uh, when Peter was released from jail was it wasn't Lydia Dorcas was it uh, when Peter was uh, released from, from jail he he goes to the house and and uh, they think it's somebody else and uh, a spirit or something. Um, but there's very, very little there, but it, it is assumed in many ways in terms of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the, 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 I would say, I shouldn't say it's, it's assumed, I think culturally it is assumed that, that, there, uh, that there's some tra traffic back and forth in, in this sense. I, I just uh, uh, theologically, though, David, you'd say like there's a dual. Like traditional Christianity has a dualism of soul, spirit, body. You know, there's a uh, there is a separate entity that you know our soul or whatever you want to call it that uh, exists apart from the body. Some yeah. some people don't believe that as well within the Christian tradition, but but that's a, a theme, right? That was that's what I was actually going to mention that that there's a debate around whether the soul survives the body or not. And there are a number of Christians 
uh, uh, scholars who, who believe that when you die, everything dies, including your consciousness. It's all gone. Uh, the uh, Platonic version of that, however, on the other side, is that, that the soul survives the body. And uh, uh, two things after doing this, this work and stuff that I, in, in Africa, I believe, I believe the soul survives the body. I, otherwise, I have no way to explain what we just talked about this evening. If somebody could tell me, I'm happy to, to entertain other possibilities, but nothing has been viable enough for me for that. Uh, so that would put me, I suppose, in somewhere in the platonic world, where the, the spirit world is. Right, so then how do you differentiate um, demonic and, like, let's just say human spirit, somewhere in the gray area in between. How do you differentiate that? Yeah. And how do you not know? Like sometimes, like because I, I'm set on the sensitive side, so I often think that maybe it's just um, the evil one's way to distract us from God, thinking uh, that it could be good. Yes. So David, the, three answer that quickly and then you guys can have a chat afterwards. I just want to be cognizant okay. of people's time and so. Uh, I would say that, all I could say is that takes some discernment, that if you don't have that, that area called the ancestors, the departed spirits, then everything becomes a demonic. And one way I look at it is through what I would call, how do they respond, how do they act? Just because they want you out of the house in my mind, is not enough of a reason to call it demonic. And then you've got mischievous uh, spirits, and you have, have good spirits as well. So it just, I have to have a place for that. Uh, I didn't believe that before I started this research. So that's totally new to me. And by the way, does anybody know J, the name J.B. Phillips that wrote English, Anglican, Evangelical, who wrote a paraphrase of the New Testament years ago? You're too young to remember J.B. Phillips. He was a friend of C.S. Lewis. And uh, he writes about an account. They were good friends. C.S. Lewis dies. He is sitting in his office one day, and C.S. Lewis appears in a chair. He was struggling over some issues in his own life, decisions that he had to make, I guess. And C.S. Lewis appears. And they turn to each other, and they have a conversation. Now, J.P. Phillips, I, 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 John Bowen knows the, the book that it's in, but he gives that account. So when I have stories like that, I have to take that seriously somehow. And, uh, uh, and by the way, after the conversation, it tended to resolve the issue that he was struggling with. And then C.S. Lewis disappears. So we'll end the evening on that little anecdote. And uh, I'd just like to thank... Uh, Dr. Reed for taking the time coming up. Uh, please feel free to have uh, more beer and more drinks and more conversation. And uh, we'll see you again at the, I mean, yeah, over in that corner. At the end of the month, we'll uh, see you again for the next Theology Pub. Thank you, everybody.